This is kind of our depiction of nutritional ketosis. Uh, and the difference between uh, essentially no ketones, where your ketone fueling and your ketone signaling is put to sleep by eating carbohydrates, to a level between 0.5 and, and 3 millimolar, which is an area in which ketones function as a fuel and an epigenetic signal. Um, and this is what we named nutritional ketosis because when I went through my training, we, it was either no ketones or ketones are bad for you because of ketoacidosis. The key point is there's a tenfold difference between having had you know, two poached eggs and some bacon for breakfast versus having you know, toast and pancakes for breakfast. So 0 0.1, 0 0.3 is carb fed, 1 to 3 is nutritional ketosis, so that's a tenfold difference. But then from 1 to 3 up to 10 to 30 is nutritional ketosis. So it's a difference between 1 to 10 to 100. And that's not subtle. And yet, very much often in the literature, people say, oh, well, you know, ketones are bad for you. Uh, but they don't differentiate between 10 and 100. Our clinical experience is that 1 is better than 0.5, but 0.5 is where clear beneficial effects begin. We have not been able to delineate a benefit in terms of diabetes reversal and weight management above between 1 and 3. Now, there are people doing cancer research, particularly in animals, and work by Dominic D'Agostino and, um, and others, suggests that five to seven is, is the optimum if you're a, a mouse or a rat with cancer. We don't, and, you know, it's hard to translate from animals to humans. Uh, but to get there, most people would have to take ketone supplements in addition to carb restriction. Uh, and so that's really a, a combination of exogenous ketones plus endogenous ketones, but we still don't know that that's the optimum area. The signs are subtle, and that's people feel more energy, they feel less compulsion around food, cravings get better, but those are very subtle signs. Yeah, I'm typically in the uh, 0.8 to 1 in the morning, and by I'm a person who goes low and comes up in the afternoon. I don't really notice anything. For instance, people talk about ketone breath which is acetone, which is coming. I don't really notice, and, and my wife doesn't notice ketone breath till 0.5. Yeah. Uh, but if I go for a two hour bike ride and come home, she says, stay away. The more insulin resistant a person is, the more impediment there is to fatty acid mobilization. And we think that that's why some people are struggle to get ketones up in even the one to two range. Um, uh, there may be other factors. The other is we know that that when people have an acute inflammatory illness, their ketones go to the basement. But so ketones are a, I mean, sorry, inflammation, you know, acute inflammation is, is the enemy of ketosis. Uh, and I, I don't know the mechanism for that, but it, we saw it in the hospital when we had put patients on intravenous ketogenic diets in preparation for surgery. If they had a wound infection or something, we could tell the infection was coming because the ketones disappeared. Um, uh, I don't think that low-grade inflammation associated, for instance, with diabetes, you know, someone whose C-reactive protein or white cell count are trending upwards, I don't think that's enough to suppress them. An attempt to kind of depict in, in a two-dimensional form uh, how different diets where carbohydrates are shown on the vertical axis and protein on the, this axis, and this is in uh, percent of energy relative to not the one's intake, but one's daily energy expenditure. So this is percent as if one were eating a maintenance diet and say, say well, if, if there's 30% um, carbs and there's 20% protein, where's the rest? And that would be the third dimension, which is fat. And we're not showing fat intake on here. So you just have to add in fat intake. But the point is that popular diets ranging from what I would call an extreme low fat diet, like the Ornish diet in the US, you know, which is a mostly plant, mostly are all plant-based diet and about 60 to 70% carbs would be way up here, very low in fat, and uh, um, I'm sorry, very, very low, in, low in protein and very low in fat. This is our standard American diet, but you can probably call it SAD, the standard Australian diet. Um, uh, again, in, in around 50 to 55% of energy is carbs. The Mediterranean diet is, has many definitions, um, uh, and probably the people in the, Mediter in the Mediterranean region would, would argue over whose, whose region, sub-region is the best. Uh, but typically, it's between 30 and 40 percent of energy as, as, as carbs and, and 10 to 15 percent as fat. And paleo, uh, uh, again, has lots of definitions. Um, but, but Professor Lauren Cordain, who really was a scientist who did the initial research on this and defined this, 
uh, defined it as 20 to 30 percent of energy as carbs and, and centering around 30 percent of energy as fat. To be in nutritional ketosis is actually a very small island, metabolic island here. You have to stay under, typically under 10 percent of energy as carbs. And the higher you go in protein, the less carbs you can tolerate because the protein is anti-ketogenic. Um, so we try to get people in the 12 to 20 percent of, of daily energy expenditure as protein um, and keep the carbs under 10 percent. And of course, when you look at that, it's horrifying because when you add up the rest of it, it's 75 to 80 percent of energy is fat. Because we like to do it per kilogram of lean body mass, but it's hard to, even with some of the bioelectrical impedance devices, it's hard to get an accurate measure of, of actual lean body mass. So we're trying to feed lean body mass. So what we take is a, the stature of a, of a, quote, normal weight person of that height, male or female. And that's the reference weight. So it's, if, if, if you're my age, you remember we used to have ideal body weight tables. And we pin them up in our office and on the wall just next to the scale. And a person can look at that and say, oh, I'm supposed to weigh 147 pounds. Oops. Uh, the, the ideal, there is no such thing as ideal body weight because you can be metabolically healthy at a very different weight, above or below that number. But we use that as kind of a reference to estimate lean body mass. And we're feeding that protein to feed the lean body mass. And these numbers are centered around 1.5 grams of protein per kilogram of lean body mass. Okay. And in the U.S., our recommended dietary allowance is 0.8. So this is about double the RDA. But it's actually in the range where most uh, people in developed countries who are not pure vegan vegetarians, this is around where most peop people's protein intake is. So this is not high protein, even though it's above the, the minimum RB RDA value. We go up to two grams per kilo, and particularly for athletes doing high-intensity training, uh, we'll go up to two grams per kilo. Uh, rather than 1.5. We haven't seen any benefit above there in terms of, uh, of uh, studies where Jeff has actually had people do resistance exercise and measure that not just their ability to retain, but their ability to gain lean tissue while losing weight. So again, it's the, the 2.0 is the, at the top end, 1.2 at the bottom end, and people need to find their place in the middle. And again, if your ketones aren't desirable and you, you think you're, you know, you, know, you may want to titrate down a little bit, if you're, you're maintaining good ketones and you want to build lean body mass, you can titrate up a bit. Humans have been carnivores for you know, th hundreds of thousands of years. When we looked at, at, at modern carnivores where we actually had people who uh, wrote things down, um, it appears that uh, groups like the Maasai, the Native Americans who, who uh, uh, nomadic peoples who tracked the, the buffalo in the Great Plains didn't practice agriculture, the Inuit in the Arctic tended to eat in the range of this value of 1.5 or 2 grams per kilo. Um, there were times in, in the food cycle when the, when the game was lean and they would eat higher. Still guessing. We're trying to reverse engineer from a few points of data. You know, we got uh, three square inches of the Mona Lisa and we're trying to figure out what she looks like. So there's room for, for maneuvering there. One of the things that I worry about, and we'll come to this, is potassium intake. Uh, and if somebody does pure carnivore, and keeps their protein relatively low, if they're not eating vegetables, where does the potassium come from? And so they, a person may need to eat more, more of the lean protein to get the intracellular potassium to meet that need. We have, we have uh, uh, femur and um, lumbar spine values. At two years, we see no sign, in, no sign of change in mineral density in lumbar spine in a group of people who's lost, lost and maintained more than 10% of their body weight on a ketogenic diet. And we're really happy to see that because of this idea that ketones make your kidneys waste calcium. And so it's, it's one of those situations where no change is good news. This is the ketone data from our, our patients in the Indiana University Health Study. And this is 216 people followed out to, to 12 months. And again, we, what we see is... Um, Again, people with type 2 diabetes are highly insulin resistant, and you know, it's a victory to get people above 0.5. And they, they were able to stay above 0.5 out to here, out to eight months. Now, they were becoming more insulin sensitive, and yet the ketones are going down. And so there are questions about increased ability to use them. Um, so um, uh, you know, maybe they're, they're using them more efficiently, but our experience is for these people that they're they're expanding the range of their food intake. Uh, and uh, so, you know, they're experimenting with their, their tolerance coming out to this point. Uh, 
Uh, but still, they're maintaining ketones at 0.4, whereas a fully carb-fed person is going to be in the 0 0.1, 0 0.2 range. Pierre? When somebody goes on a well-formulated ketogenic diet, and I first saw this and reported it in 1980, and then pretty much every study I've done where we measured thyroid function, the hormone, the pre-hormone made by the thyroid gland, which is tetraiodothyronine, we call it T4 for short, has four iodines on it. To make active thyroid hormone, you have to whack off one of the iodines. That's done by the liver. And so the, the, when we measure T4 on a ketogenic diet, it stays nice and constant. When we measure T3, it plummets. I mean, it typically drops 40% in the first week or two, and then stays down. And it happens in overweight people, it happens in older people, it happened in my bike racers, uh, and so it happened in the, the guys who were the ultra marathon runners. Uh, the, 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 the ultra marathoners in the faster study had very low T4s compared to the guys, or T3s compared to the guys who were eating the high carb diet. And when, and we, Jeff Volick did one study where he actually measured resting metabolism, which is probably your best measure of youth thyroid state. And in a crossover study where guys were on the ketogenic diet, I think for three weeks, and then they were on the, the high carb diet for three weeks or vice versa, there was no difference, statistically no difference in resting metabolism, even though their T3 was down dramatically. In fact, it trended slightly higher. Uh, and then since the year 2000 or so, we've had this thing called TSH, which is the brain signal say, make more, make more. And if, they, if the body was hypothyroid, TSH should go up and it doesn't. So the evidence is that the body becomes much more T3 sensitive, increased sensitivity to the hormone. So you get a lot more metabolic mileage out of the, 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 that hot hormone, which means there's less work for the thyroid and the liver to do. And it fits into the pattern that we also see improved insulin sensitivity. So actually, there's evidence that we're seeing multiple hormonal sensitivities improving in lockstep when people go on this diet. Uh, in other words, it, you know, it's like, you know, getting twice the mileage out of a per gallon of gas in your car. Dr. Kushner, I'm starting to sweat. But I'm just saying, this points out a potential danger because there's a whole industry in the United States, and I'm sure here as well, where people are prescribing T3 for a low T3 because they claim that the TSH doesn't adequately reflect the, the, the body's uh, thyroid exposure. And for someone who's on nutritional ketosis, this could be a real problem because you would essentially be creating an artificial hyperthyroid state. Yes, actually a guy named Louis Vignati in 1978 did that at uh, the uh, Beth Israel Medical Center in a group of people on a supplemented fast. And when he made them brought the T3 up to their previously fed level. Uh, their metabolic rate went a little bit higher, but their protein wasting, it was their pro protein breakdown accelerated. And it was published back then and people have totally ignored that. By the way, our data is, we haven't published that metabolic rate data anywhere else than in our blog. Because, you know, we have a hard time getting stuff published and, you know, we just, we'll put it in the blog. So it's in the blog on vertahealth.com and the, the, the title is, Does Your Thyroid Need Carbs? indicating the range of foods that people can eat on a well-formulated ketogenic diet. And again, it shows the carbs in the 5 to 10% range. Uh, but it includes the fact that we encourage people to eat uh, uh, non-starchy vegetables, contributing uh, in the range of uh, 10 to 15 grams of, of total carbs. Um, uh, and you know, that varies from, uh, from Brussels sprouts and kale, which are fairly high, to, to lettuce, which is quite, and spinach, which is quite low. But typically, we have people eating four or five servings of of non-starchy vegetables per day. Um, we add berry fruits, which includes avocado and tomato as well as berries. The uh, reason we have called those berry fruits is they're in the five to 10% by weight sugar or carb range in, in, in prepared form. And that five to 10 grams means that you can have 100 grams of berry fruit per day. It doesn't mean 100 grams of berries, 100 grams of avocado, and 100 grams of tomato. It's in total. So we're talking about things which are a garnish in the diet. Um, and that's, those are there for not just the volume. And by the way, you can put you know, olive oil or you know, saute your, your cauliflower or, your, or kale or things in, in olive oil. And, and that's a way of getting good fat in, in the diet. So you take some of this stuff here and you mix it with some of this stuff here and then cook it together. So it's a vehicle to get fat in its volume. It it's, uh, adds appeal and taste appeal to the foods. Um, and then nuts and seeds 
uh, we like because they're portable and, uh, and quite satisfying when people eat them, and they contain a considerable amount of magnesium, um, which again is the nutrient that, that people benefit from. And the other source of magnesium is anything that's leafy green and pointed at the sun contains magnesium because chlorophyll, which is the chemical, the, you know, the, the, the key chemical in photosynthesis has to have magnesium coordinated in the middle of the molecule. So if you wonder where, where to find magnesium, it's either in the things that are growing and pointed at the sun, or it's the nuts and seeds that are designed to have that starter, startup that makes that green plant come out of the ground. We have this bizarre, had this bizarre reality TV thing in the United States called The Biggest Loser. And uh, Kevin Hall, who I don't agree with most of the time, uh, did a study of people five years after they went through that show and showed that with, an ex with extreme caloric restriction and exercise, they could see a metabolic impairment five years later that represented about a four to 500 calorie per day decrement in energy expenditure. And, and that was based on a reduced uh, expenditure per kilogram of lean body mass. It didn't mean that they had atrophied muscles. The muscles they had had a lower metabolic rate. So those muscles had been essentially it had suffered long-term damage. I won't say permanent, but long-term damage. So the reason we feed to satiety is we want people to follow their internal signals. Uh, and we don't think that we see that. But again, we're, you know, I've done smaller studies you know, out to two years. So tachycardia and heart racing. One is um, if people exercise without maintaining adequate fluid and sodium intake, they'll start out hypovolemic. So the circulating volume will be contracted to begin with. And as soon as you expend 100 calories, that will warm your body from 37 to 38 degrees centigrade. You'll vasodilate, and the heart is going to have not enough fluid, and, and it'll, you'll, have you'll have a, a tachycardic response because there's inadequate circulatory, circulatory volume. That's easily corrected with a liter of fluid and a, a cup of bouillon. But if people are magnesium depleted, and particularly people with diabetes, we are surprised by how frequently we see magnesium, signs of magnesium depletion. And that's muscle fasciculations, little twitches, and it's muscle cramps, um, and it's persistent hypokalemia, persistent, you know, even if you give people extra potassium, their blood levels stay low. But magnesium depletion in the heart leads to tachydysrhythmia. And hopefully people will notice that early on and, and get corrected as opposed to having a, a really serious one that uh, is a non-perfusing rhythm. Uh, so I would be worried about it. And the first thing I'd go is fluid, volume, and sodium. And if that doesn't help people with the problem, then, then I would. Uh, and again, my, my favorite test for magnesium depletion, because the blood test is terrible because almost all your magnesium is inside your muscles or inside your bones, very little in the blood. So it doesn't accurately reflect your status. So I just do a, a simple deep tendon reflex test. And if it's hyperreflexic, uh, that's a, a sign that, that uh, the person may have uh, inadequate intracellular magnesium. But for some reason, people with, with diabetes appear to have either problems absorbing or more likely uh, impaired renal conservation. And so they get into trouble with that. There was a, a guy named John Garrow, who was a very famous met, uh, obesity and metabolism researcher in the UK. He lived in London, but he had a summer home in, in a village in Scotland. And every summer, he'd go and spend a couple of weeks in Scotland. And this is back in the 1950s when there wasn't much money for doing research. So he would go to, to Scotland with a scale. And there were about 150 people who lived in this village. And every day, or every year, he'd set up the scale in the pub, and people come in and weigh everybody in the village. Men, women, kids, young, old. But over the course of a decade, he demonstrated that most of the population, unless they were teen, kids and teens or women uh, during pregnancy, most of them stayed remarkably weight stable from year to year. They might have been overweight or a little underweight, but they're, they're stable. And the average adult eats somewhere between three-fourths of a million and a million calories a year. And if you're, your weight is staying within a five-pound zone, you're, you're just spontaneously controlling your, your energy balance within 1%. You know, that's 99 forkfuls versus 100 forkfuls. I mean, think of it. I mean, it's very precise. What we're seeing here and what we've seen in many people who follow a ketogenic diet chronically is they may not get down to a perfect, you know, you know the ideal body weight, but they achieve metabolic health and they come to a new steady state. And so we need to think of this not as a set point that owns you, but this is, uh, we hope, a new settling point, that this is what you're 
your body spontaneously defended weight is when you're in a mild state of nutritional ketosis. But it's, it's really intriguing that we'll some, we think this look, has all the fingerprints that we're getting into that regulatory mechanism and shifting it in a positive direction and with that achieving improved metabolic health. Uh, this is a, a, a basically an attempt to depict what happens when people uh, start on, who have weight to lose, who start on a ketogenic diet. If you've kind of reset their settling point, they eat to satiety at, a, at an intake that's far less than what they're burning. And there is this slow chronic progression for most people as they lose weight. So we're, this is kind of a, a, um, an average five foot six inch woman who started at 180 pounds. Um, I can't make kilos out of that. Uh, but you know, got down to about uh, from what, 90 kilos to 70 kilos. Um, and over time, that if we hold carbs pretty constant, maybe add back a little as they become more insulin sensitive, keep protein constant, in this case about 90 grams per day, they, that person will spontaneously, eating to society, raise their fat intake up to the point where they come to a new steady state. Now you'll notice that the calories burned we're estimating here come from 2,400 down to 2,000. Even with a modest reduction in energy expenditure, we reach a balance point which realistically is in this range. And again, uh, here this is, represents 70% fat, about 20% carbs, and I'm sorry, 5% carbs and 15% protein. This, but this is not something we prescribe. This is the natural phenomenon for most people. Who, need to, who want to lose and have extra weight to lose when they go on a ketogenic diet. Most dry wines, you know, so your you know, uh, Cabs, your Syrahs, your Pinot Noirs, and then uh, Chardonnay, um, Sauvignon Blanc, uh, I'm not gonna say anything about New Zealand and wonderful wines, but anyway, well, white ones anyway. Most of them are fermented down to less than 2% by weight sugar. So if you have 100 cc's, that's one to two grams of carbs. So you can have two, gra two glasses of dry wine and less than five grams of carbs. So that would go in as an ounce of berry fruit. I'm sorry, yeah. That's, that, yeah. The fascinating thing about ethanol, ethanol does not interfere with ketosis. Liver can handle that just fine, turns it into fat and we burn it, you know. And we, by the way, even people who drink in moderation, their liver fat levels go down markedly when they go into a ketogenic diet. In part because if my liver is making 100 grams of ketones a day, it's got to find 50 grams of fat to make that out of from, from the liver. So the, you know, it's, it's actually a great way of getting fat out of your liver is, is letting it make ketones and secrete them into the blood. But here's the problem. Who here has had, say, three drinks before dinner and then found that they were, weren't hungry enough to eat dinner? Alcohol is remarkably non-satiating. If I had 300 grams of fat before dinner, I'd eat 300 grams less at the meal. Fat's very satiating. Uh, in Salim Youssef's group at McMaster University uh, in Hamilton, Ontario, they have been spearheading a 17-country study uh, called the PURE study. Uh, and in this study, they have been analyzing multiple lifestyle factors and outcomes in people in 17 different countries, and they're adding to the volume and adding to the duration. This is an ongoing uh, uh, thing and you may have heard this last summer that they published a paper that said when they looked at saturated fat intake in people um, in 17 different countries uh, what they found was as you um, uh, reduced the saturated fat intake mortality it, under 10 percent of energy per day of, of one's, one's fat intake uh, mortality goes up but there's no mortality increase at high end you know, and they published that in the New England Journal of Medicine. This came out in the New England Journal in 19, or 2014. And what they did was, rather than ask people, how much salt did you eat yesterday? Which is how sodium intake is often analyzed in, in epidemiological studies. And this is epidemiology. What they had people do was do a first morning void, pee in a cup in the morning. Uh, now that's not the, the gold standard. The gold standard is to have them collect every drop of urine for 24 hours. But in people wandering around in Bangladesh, you know, carrying a two-gallon jug to measure, you know, I've done 24-hour urine collections on myself for 45 straight days as a research subject, and man, it really inhibits your social life. <laughs> it's not realistic. So they got an 85%, the R value, the correlation coefficient was 85.85. 
for first morning voyage to two uh, 24 hour collections in a so sub cohort of people. And what they found was, so it's, it's a validated assay. What they found was that if you look at mortality risk, this odds ratio is the risk of death from any cause. And 2.0 2 means uh, more than double. And anything under this line is less. But what they, you know, they found that the low point of, of mortality followed for three points, there's 102,000 people followed for 3.7 years. This is a huge data set that the low point of mortality was between four and five grams of sodium intake per, or excretion per day. And we assume that, because we don't store sodium in the body in any significant amount, that the intake equals excretion. Our, my government dictates that we should all eat 2.3 grams of sodium per day. And if you have congestive heart failure or hypertension, you should eat even less. And that's associated, associated with a 50% increased risk of mortality compared to the four to five grams per day. Now add to that that when you're on a ketogenic diet, you experience something called naturesis of fasting. Natrium is the Latin word for sodium. It's increased sodium excretion through the kidneys. It appears to be due to increased production of good prostaglandins in the kidney. Uh, because we know that because if you take Motrin, it'll shut off. I don't know if anybody here has taken two Motrin after a hard exercise and they gain four pounds the next day. And that's from fluid retention caused by shutting off the naturesis of fasting. But the point is, that if anything, the sodium requirement, if somebody's excreting this at a more rapid rate, would be on this side of, of this point. And so our range that we recommend is five grams a day, unless somebody has ongoing hypertension or congestive heart failure. And for people exercising in the heat with greater than, greater than expected sodium losses due to sweat, um, they can go as high as eight grams per day. I mean, this is frightening. This is like telling people they should eat 75% of their calories as fat. <laughs> And we tell them to do both, which is why we have to have such an intensive education and support system, because we're practicing multiple heresies. But when we do this here, people don't have symptoms of the Atkins flu or keto flu. I'll stop preaching now. Yeah. And I think I'd just like to stress that it's sodium, not even salt. So that's five of sodium. That would be 10 grams of salt. Yes, this is sodium. We try to stay around three, and we pay attention to symptoms. But what's really interesting is people with congestive heart failure and hypertension, within the first month of going on a ketogenic diet, usually show, show marked improvement. And so we can actually move them from, from there to here as they progress to, to, to greater metabolic health. So my GP just said, put salt in your food. And I don't count it, I just put salt in and it's okay. Yeah, salt to taste. Mm. You know, when we get the diet right, which empowers your, the instincts we were all born with, uh, you're, you're probably going to get the get, you know, get it right. So, you, you, when in doubt, trust your instincts. When they're taking a the thyretic, thiazide diuretic or a loop diuretic, uh, we don't add sodium. We keep it in the, the two and a half to three gram. We counsel two to half, three grams per day. But those are some of the particularly the thiazides and and then the furosemide are the things I want to get them off early, uh, because what happens is when they like with you have too much insulin. When you have too much diuretic, uh, you're going to have people who are out in the sun and they're going to pass out yeah. um, uh, because it impair that and beta blockers impair their ability to, to, to respond to a hypovolemic challenge. So again, less meds is better as long as they're metabolically improved in, in terms of health and, and these parameters. This is potassium. This is from the exact same paper and this is the exact same cohort, 102,000 people followed for 3.7 years. And look at the shape of this curve in terms of mortality risk, and I just, I mean, we're not talking about anybody's numbers, but this is one gram of potassium per day. That's two and that's three. And you, it's going from two down to 0.8. Now, what other nutrient do we know that we can adjust across a, a threefold range? And, and, and again, this is epidemiology. It doesn't prove that if you take people from one to three, you're gonna cut their mortality rate by more than half. But it certainly strongly implies that hypothesis, and we have the mechanism. Now, the reason why I put this up here, and you know, there was a question about the carnivorous diet. If, you follow, if people follow my protein recommendations, which is 1.5 grams per kilo, and they use fresh meat, you know, real meat, chicken, fish, 
So real food meat, not hot dogs, <laughs> and not luncheon meat, because when you process food, you take the potassium out of it to a great extent. It still tastes savory because they put more salt in. Salt's not bad, but losing the potassium is a big deal. So using unprocessed meat, and you eat 1.5 per kilo, you're going to get about one gram per day of potassium intake. That's not enough. So if somebody's not eating any vegetables, and if they're not taking bones and you know, undesirable pieces of the animal and putting it in a pot and boiling it, where there's enough flesh in there that you're getting potassium. So you know, when people talk about bone broth, well, I like bone broth, but I like bone and meat broth. You know, when you make broth, you can add um, uh, a certain, certain amount of potassium, and it may be as much as a gram per day if you're having two cups of homemade broth. So the way you get more potassium is you add vegetables or you add vegetables and broth. But the other way to get from here to here would be to double your protein intake. So maybe the reason why people instinctively want to eat more protein when they're on a carnivore, you know, a, 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 a pure carnivorous diet is that that's where you get to at least this relatively safe spot. You can buy a, a, um, a, a commercial on, you know, in the, on the grocery shelf that's 50% sodium chloride, 50% potassium chloride. It's half potassium. So if you take a level teaspoon of that, you'll get, I think, a bit over one gram of potassium. You know, when I first got into this business, I said, it's great. You know, you got body fat. You can release those fats. The liver will take it up and make ketones that will feed your brain. Yay, cool. This is much more complex. And most of it is good. We now know that the heart is, loves ketones. And the failing heart, in particular, prefers ketones because once the liver makes the ketones, it takes oxygen to make ketones in the liver. So you, fat comes to the liver, you've got to have oxygen coming to the liver to make ketones. Once they're in the blood as fuel, the heart can generate energy with 20% less oxygen. So if you have an artery that isn't this big, but that big, and there's not much oxygen coming into your heart, but you've got ketones there, you can get more ETP from, the small, from that limited amount of oxygen. Uh, hey, you know, 20, a 20% 20 advantage is, again, if I had a drug that did that, I, I could retire. <laughs> there has been a study done, two studies done in the US on health span and lifespan in mice. Um, uh, with either an intermittent uh, ketogenic diet or a continuous ketogenic diet. The ones that are given the continuous ketogenic diet live 13% longer. And here's the really two neat things about them. When they were, they lived to be like 1,100 days. Most mice, when they get to 900 days, they're senile. Can't remember where, where to go, where the food is. They can't hang on to things. You know, they can't walk across a narrow strip over water. Uh, and they don't notice new novel things in their environment. These animals on the ketogenic diet maintain their youthful uh, muscle, nerve, and uh, uh, um, um, awareness at, out to 900 days. So the health span was dramatically improved and they lived 13% longer. And when they did autopsies when they died, they found l less than half as many cancers. Because these mice, the C C57 black six strain, commonly dies of cancer at, 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 at old age. And the, the frequency of cancer was reduced. At, at the, we, they lived longer and had fewer cancers. Does that prove it works in humans? No, I will tell everybody that mice are not a good model for humans, but it's a good basis for a hypothesis. Uh, and uh, hopefully this will stimulate a lot more research on that.